This is a, an historical perspective on budget execution. Why do we have rules anyway in budget execution? How did they get started? Well, it all begins, of course, with the Constitution. Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7 gives the legislative branch the power of the purse. No money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. But the Constitution doesn't really provide any explicit how-to instructions on how the Congress should implement its appropriation power. So how does Congress do this? There are a couple of ways. One is through annual appropriations. They stipulate how much money can be spent, for how long, and for what purpose. But they also passed a series of laws over time which established rules. Most of these laws were passed to curb perceived abuses by the executive branch. In fact, it would be easy to say that most federal fiscal law arises from the natural antithesis of two conflicting desires. The desire of the executive branch for flexibility and the desire of the legislative branch to maintain fiscal control. So what rules are we talking about? Let's set them out in five different areas. Time. How long does the executive branch have to spend money? Purpose. For what reasons may the executive branch spend money? Amount. How much does the executive branch get and how much flexibility do they have? Preventing deficiencies. An impoundment. Let's start with time. In 1789, the very first Congress, in their very first appropriation, enacted for the service of the present year. This established the concept of an annual appropriation. Initially, the appropriations were made on a calendar year basis, but how long? the money be kept available. Congress decided this in 1795 when they required that unexpended balances be transferred to a surplus fund two years after expiration, limiting the agency's ability to spend funds. Note the language. In regard to any sum which shall have remained unexpended, for more than two years after the expiration of the calendar year in which the appropriation shall have been passed. The sum so unexpended shall be carried to an account on the books of the Treasury to be denominated the surplus fund. I should point out that the surplus fund wasn't a specific pot of money. It was a Congress's way of expressing that the funds were no longer available to the executive branch to be spent. There was a little bit of a loophole found by the Departments of Navy and War in that 1795 Act, which they thought allowed them to keep their unexpected balances. The Treasury warrants were taken from the Treasury and held by the Treasurer for the use of the Departments of Navy and War. So they thought that these funds 
weren't really covered by the 1795 Act. Moving on to another topic, purpose. From 1789 to 1792, the first appropriations were in gross amounts, with not a lot of specificity as to purpose. In order to exert their power of the purse, Congress began to make specific appropriations in 1792. But the executive branch complained about a lack of flexibility in these specific appropriations, so they just lumped the funds together. Congress wasn't happy with this, so in 1809 they reacted by passing the Purpose Statute. The sums appropriated by law for each branch of the expenditure in the several departments shall be solely applied to the objects for which they are respectively appropriated and to no other. This was passed at the very end of Thomas Jefferson's term in office. This rule is codified today at 31 U.S.C. 1301A and it remains in effect. Impoundment. An impoundment is any executive action or inaction that temporarily or permanently withholds, delays, or precludes the obligation or expenditure of budgetary resources. The very first example of an impoundment occurred in 1803 when President Jefferson impounded $50,000 for gunboats because Louisiana Purchase made war less likely. Back to time. The Department of Navy and War loophole allowing them to keep their unexpended balances was closed in the Act of 1820 in the term of James Monroe. Note the language. It shall be the duty of the Secretaries of War and Navy Departments to cause any balance of monies drawn out of the Treasury which shall remain unexpended after the object for which the appropriation was made shall be effected to be repaid to the Treasury of the United States, and such monies, when so repaid, shall be carried to the surplus fund. Amount Prior to 1820, federal agencies signed contracts without sufficient appropriations to pay for them. In response to this, in 1820, Congress passed the Adequacy of Appropriations Act. This stated that no contract shall hereafter be made except under a law authorizing the same or under an appropriation adequate to its fulfillment. This took place during the term of James Monroe. The statute was restated in 1861 and codified at 41 U.S.C. 6301A, and it remains in effect today. Back to time. In 1842, Congress established the federal fiscal year as July 1st through June 30th. Prior to this date, the government did not distinguish between a calendar and a fiscal year. This was done during the term of John Tyler. Amount Prior to 1849, executive agencies sometimes collected money owed to the United States and used the funds to pay salaries and expenses. When Congress figured this out, they saw this as an augmentation of those appropriations. They felt that this violated their power of the purse, so they passed the Miscellaneous Receipts Statute in the term of James K. Polk. This stated that the gross amounts of all duties received from customs, sales of public lands, all miscellaneous sources for the use of the United States, shall be paid 
by the officer receiving it into the Treasury of the United States at as early a day as practicable. This means that unless otherwise authorized by law, an agency may not augment their appropriations, that is, keep money received from sources other than congressional appropriations. It has to be deposited into the Treasury. This miscellaneous receipt statute, which ratifies the Congress's power of the purse, was codified 31 U.S.C. 3302B and remains in effect today. I should point out that there are statutory authorities to augment appropriations, such things as user fees, reimbursable agreements, revolving funds, and so forth, are statutory exceptions to this requirement that all funds be returned to the Treasury. Time. In 1852, Congress felt that they needed to reiterate the 1795 Act requirement to transfer unexpended balances to the surplus fund two years after expiration. At that time, they also stipulated that such funds could not be used for any purpose without further and specific appropriation by law. This is during the term of Millard Fillmore. The language stated, It shall not be lawful for any cause or pretense whatsoever to transfer, withdraw, apply, or use for any purpose whatever any monies carried as aforesaid to the surplus fund without further and specific appropriations by law. But what happens if you can't complete a contract within two years of expiration? This particular requirement to transfer unexpended funds to the surplus fund two years after expiration created problems for the executive branch regarding contracts. So, in 1853, Franklin Pierce's Treasury Secretary interpreted unexpended as unobligated to avoid the problem of requiring contracts to be fully paid within two years. In addition, in 1854, Pierce's Attorney General wrote opinions suggesting that appropriations should be used on a first-in, first-out basis, thereby getting around having to transfer funds to the surplus fund. During the Civil War, there was a temporary cessation of congressional efforts to hold the executive branch to specific expenditures under specific appropriations. The appropriations were freely mingled and deficiencies were supplemented by unexpended balances without regard to purpose. But by the end of the Civil War, the FIFO, the first in, first out interpretation of the Pierce administration, resulted in huge sums remaining on the books. This lack of time constraint on appropriations and improper use of unexpended balances led Congress to act. So, in 1870, during the term of Ulysses S. Grant, Congress passed the Bona Fide Needs Statute, requiring that unexpended balances of appropriations made for a definite period of time be used only for expenses properly incurred during that time period. The language, all balances of appropriations contained in the annual appropriation bills and made specifically for the service of any fiscal year and remaining unexpended at the expiration of such fiscal year shall only be applied to the payment of expenses properly incurred during that year or to the fulfillment of contracts properly made within that year. This meant that all those balances that were just sitting in the Treasury from earlier years could not be used to pay for anything uh, except those original obligations. 
This statute was codified at 31 U.S.C. 1502A and is still in effect today. Back to amount. In 1870, in the same period of time, the Navy Department obligated funds that were more than double available resources, thereby creating what's called coercive deficiency. A course of deficiency is what happens when the executive branch runs out of money and sort of coerces or forces the Congress to appropriate more. As you can imagine, this did not make Congress very happy. So in 1870, they passed the original Anti-Deficiency Act in the same legislation as the Bonafide Needs Statute. This act prohibited spending in excess of appropriations made by Congress for that fiscal year or involving the government in a contract for future payments in excess of appropriations. It was been codified at 31 U.S.C. 1341 and is still in effect today. Sticking with amount. In the 1880s, executive agencies asked employees to volunteer to perform overtime work, thereby creating a deficiency for Congress to fund. In 1884, Congress reacted by prohibiting voluntary service in excess of that authorized by law during the term Chester Arthur. Note the hereafter. Hereafter. No department or officer of the United States shall accept voluntary service for the government in excess of that authorized by law, except in cases of sudden emergency involving the loss of human life or the destruction of property. Congress thought so strongly about this that in 1905 they actually amended the Anti Deficiency Act, adding this prohibition on voluntary services during the term of Teddy Roosevelt. It said, nor shall any department or officer of the government accept voluntary service of the government. And they still had the exceptions for emergency uh, and loss of human life or destruction of property. This particular prohibition in the Anti-Deficiency Act is the reason why we have issues with folks working during a shutdown. This prohibition is codified at 31 U.S.C. 1342 and is, of course, still in effect today. Preventing Deficiencies The passage of the Anti-Deficiency Act in 1870 unfortunately did not stop coercive deficiencies. In 1879, the post office entered into contracts that would exhaust all their appropriations by April. The Postmaster General claimed that contracts could be canceled and not paid, but the mail delivery would stop. Of course, Congress was not very happy with this. This took place, by the way, during the term of Rutherford B. Hayes. So what did Congress do? They amended the Anti-Deficiency Act in 1905, adding an apportionment requirement. Funds had to be apportioned by monthly or other allotments as to prevent undue expenditures in one portion of the year that may require deficiency or additional appropriations to complete the service of the fiscal year. But. Who would approve these apportionments? There was no government-wide budget office, so agencies apportioned themselves. But agency heads could and did waive the requirement. All such apportionments shall be adhered to except when waived or modified in specific cases by the written order of the head of the executive department having control of the expenditure. And, of course, if they could waive them, they did. 
They had as many Anti-Deficiency Act violations as they had had before. But this amendment also added penalties. Any person violating any provision of this section shall be summarily removed from office and may also be punished by a fine of not less than $100 or by imprisonment for not less than one month. In 1906, Congress amended the Anti-Deficiency Act again, tightening up on the waiver authority. Waivers restricted to extraordinary emergencies or unusual circumstance, and Congress had to be notified. Notice that apportionment shall not be waived or modified except upon the happening of some extraordinary ordinary emergency or unusual circumstance, which could not be anticipated at the time. And they had to submit the reasons in each particular case and communicate them to Congress. In 1921, the Congress finally created the Bureau of the Budget in the Treasury Department in the Budget and Accounting Act, but they didn't give the Bureau of the Budget the apportionment authority. It stayed with the agencies. This was during the term of Warren G. Harding. Charles Dawes, who was the first director of the Bureau of the Budget, issued a regulation requiring that agencies notify the Bureau of the Budget of all apportionments and waivers of apportionments. At the same time, he issued a circular setting forth some procedures for establishing reserves and effecting savings. Since the main objective of apportionment was to prevent deficiencies, appropriations were to be treated as ceilings, not directives to spend. The estimated savings were to be designated as a general reserve. This was probably the earliest executive policy on impoundment. In 1933, FDR issued Executive Order 6166, transferring the apportionment authority to the Bureau of the Budget. And in 1939, he issued another Executive Order 8248, transferring the Bureau of the Budget to the Executive Office of the President. By bringing this power of the apportionment into the executive office of the president, FDR compelled obedience to the Anti-Deficiency Act. He was probably the first president that saw the value of the apportionment as a budget tool. Appoundment. For FDR, the apportionment process had two objectives, to prevent deficiencies, as required by the Anti-Deficiency Act, but also to effect savings, as directed by administrative regulation. But in 1942, FDR remarked that these reserves to prevent deficiencies or effect savings were not a substitute for an item or blanket veto power and should not be used to set aside or nullify the expressed will of Congress. So you can see that even in 1942, FDR saw that the impoundment of funds could create issues with Congress, and he did not want to nullify the will of Congress. Preventing deficiencies. In 1947, another post office course of deficiency happened. Again, how does Congress respond? They amend the Anti-Deficiency Act, giving the Bureau of the Budget statutory authority over apportionments. Notice that Appropriation shall be apportioned or reapportioned in writing by the director of the Bureau of the Budget.
So now, instead of just being established by executive order, as it was under FDR, now it's a statutory authority given to the Bureau of the Budget by Congress. The other thing they did in the 1950 amendment was to make exceeding an apportionment or an allotment a violation. Notice that no officer shall authorize an obligation in excess of an apportionment or reapportionment or in excess of the amount permitted by regulations, which we call the allotment. The Anti-Deficiency Act amendments also required that agencies have systems of administrative control, and these were supposed to restrict obligations to apportioned amounts and enable the head of the agency to fix responsibility for creating obligations in excess of apportioned amounts. Notice the language requires a system of administrative control designed to restrict obligations to amounts of apportionments and enable the agency head to fix responsibility for creating an obligation in excess of an apportionment. At the same time, the law increased the penalties to a $5,000 fine or two years in prison. This has all been codified at 31 U.S.C. 1513, 1514, and 1517, and it's still in effect today. In fact, very few changes have been made to the Anti-Deficiency Act since 1950. Back to time. Prior to the 1940s, the government was still following that 1795 requirement to transfer unexpended funds to the surplus fund two years after expiration. But that meant that in order to pay claims from these expired funds, Congress had to reappropriate the funds, leading to delays. Every time there had to be a payment made, you had to go to Congress and get an appropriation. So Congress tried to fix this. So in in 1945, they provided such sums for the Controller General to pay certified claims under $500 from the surplus fund. So you can see the language here appropriating such sum as may be necessary to enable the Secretary of the Treasury to pay claims, not to exceed $500 in any case. But $500 wasn't enough. So then, in 1949, Congress passed the Surplus Fund Certified Claims Act to expedite claims payment. In this case, they authorized transfer of expired funds to a payment of certified claims account from which the Controller General paid certified claims. You could cause such balances to be transferred to a consolidated appropriation account to be known as the payment of certified claims, and such funds shall remain available until expended for the payment of those claims. So in other words, basically, Congress was appropriating whatever it took to pay these claims that the Comptroller General certified. All the funds in the appropriation account that were left over went to the surplus fund. The problem with this solution was that these claims still had to be handled by the Controller General. So, in 1953, the Hoover Commission recommended some new legislation that would permit agency disposition of claims instead of GAO. So, in response to that, in 1956, Congress repealed the 1949 Surplus Fund Certified Claims Act. The payment of claims was given to the federal agencies. GAO still had oversight, and they received reports from the federal agencies. This is during the term of Dwight Eisenhower. This so-called M-account legislation 
established merged, or M, accounts for the deposit of obligated but unpaid balances two years after expiration. It also established a merged surplus authority for the deposit of unobligated balances two years after expiration. These funds could be used by the agencies to pay valid claims, unrecorded obligations, increased bills, etc. The problem with this approach was that it permitted the accumulation of large balances which could be used with minimal congressional oversight. Hang on to that thought. We'll come back to this in a moment. Regarding amount, prior to 1954, federal agencies used inconsistent definitions of obligation. Congress could not accurately determine what agency needs were. So, in 1954, the recording statute was enacted in the Supplemental Appropriations Act of 1955 during the term of Dwight Eisenhower. This established the rules for documentary evidence of an obligation. No amount shall be recorded as an obligation unless it's supported by documentary evidence of a binding agreement, like a contract, a valid loan agreement, an order required by law, a grant or subsidy, a liability from pending litigation, employment or services of persons or expenses of travel, or any other legal liability. This recording statute established the rules for the proper recording of obligations that met specified standards. It also required a certified statement of obligations with the annual budget request. This statute has been codified at 31 U.S.C. 1501 and 1108 and is still in effect today. Preventing Deficiencies In 1970, in Executive Order 11541, President Nixon designated the Bureau of the Budget as the Office of Management and Budget. So OMB inherited the apportionment power from the Bureau of the Budget and continues to hold it today. Impoundment. The legislative branch believes the powers under the Article I of the Constitution authorize them to establish certain programs, determine the amount of money to be spent on them, and to compel the executive branch to execute the laws. The executive branch, however, believes the powers under Article II of the Constitution authorize the President to determine the manner of execution of Congressional appropriations as part of faithfully executing the law. Article II also provides broad authority in determining foreign affairs and national defense spending. So what's the problem? Impoundment, in effect, gives the President a line-item veto and no process for Congress to override it. Now, historically, we've had several examples of impoundment. We mentioned earlier that Jefferson impounded funds for gunboats in 1803, but he later released them. Actually, Franklin Roosevelt held back funds from public work projects. Harry Truman impounded Air Force funds and canceled a supercarrier. Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson all impounded funds. So what's the problem? In each of these cases, the political system made the necessary adjustments to accommodate the actions without a crisis. In other words, there was a give and take between the executive branch and the legislative branch and never came to a crisis. But... Under Nixon, his egregious impoundments created a crisis Congress had to deal with. So in 1974, Congress enacted the Impoundment Control Act 
response to Nixon's proliferating impoundments. This act provides an orderly mechanism for the legislative branch to respond to executive branch impoundments, and it eliminates the president's ability to act unilaterally. Impoundments were divided into two categories. First, deferrals. These are delays in spending authority. And rescissions, the cancellation of spending authority. Each required the transmission of a special message to both Houses of Congress and GAO. Though this law is still on the books, it's basically been ignored since the Clinton administration. Newer apportionment policies, which do not require a special message to Congress, have supplanted the need for the Impoundment Control Act. Proposals of cancellation rather than rescission of funds, for example. The use of Category C, an apportionment for a future period, provides a de facto deferral. Just recently, the Trump administration resurrected the use of the proposed rescission, and it was rejected by the Congress. So it remains to be seen what's going to happen in the future. In 1974, in the Congressional Budget and Impoundment Control Act, Congress established the federal fiscal year as October 1st through September 30th. The transition quarter was added to bridge the gap between the July to June fiscal year and the October to September fiscal year. No change has been made to the fiscal year since 1974. Back to time. In 1989, the Air Force used a billion dollars from the M account to fund the B-1 bomber contract modifications. This got Congress's attention. And in 1990, they repealed the 1956 M account legislation. They set the limit of availability of an account to pay obligations to five years after expiration, after which the funds are then canceled or returned to the surplus fund, as the ancient language stipulated. It also made a provision for the payment of canceled obligations from current appropriations. This legislation, which is codified at 31 U.S.C. 1551 to 1553, continues in effect today. And the history continues.